if she did. VOA won the head. Take a look inside. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from The Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, we have a story about the lack of men going to college from Andrew Smith and Faith Perlow. Then, Ana Mateo and I discuss American phrases where numbers are in the spotlight. After that, Kelly Jean Kelly brings us the opening part of our feature on Abraham Lincoln. But first, here's Dan Novak. The food and drink company Nestle says it is testing a plan to give money to farmers who grow coffee beans sustainably. The test is part of Nestle's larger goal of greatly reducing greenhouse gas emissions in its coffee business by 2030. Sustainable farming methods include using organic fertilizers to improve the soil, planting shade trees to protect coffee beans, and intercropping to protect biodiversity. Intercropping is when two plants are grown on a farm close to each other. Nestle's announcement on Tuesday comes as major food companies face increased public and legal pressure to reduce emissions worldwide. The company says it has offered money to about 3,000 coffee farmers in developing countries to help them change to sustainable farming practices. Those countries include Ivory Coast, Indonesia, and Mexico. A group of non-governmental organizations published a report in 2020 that looked at coffee production worldwide. The report, called the Coffee Barometer, found that 10 major companies produce 35% of the world's coffee. And the companies are not meeting sustainability goals set by the United Nations. The coffee industry is valued at 200 to $250 billion a year, based on the report. But producing countries receive less than 10% of that value when exporting beans. Farmers receive even less. About 125 million people around the world earn their living producing coffee. But an estimated 80% of coffee farming families live at or below the poverty line. I'm Dan Novak. Danye Gates is 18 years old and lives in Chicago, Illinois. His family wants him to go to college in the fall. But Gates is thinking about going to a trade school instead. He says he worries about the cost of college and is not sure if it will be valuable to him. Gates was in a group of high school students visiting Chicago's Malcolm X Community College. About 75% of the school's students are women. Like many colleges and universities in the United States, Malcolm X is struggling to get more male students to enroll. Women now make up about 58% of U.S. college undergraduates. That information comes from the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center. The percentage of men in higher education is getting smaller each year. Now, some universities are making extra efforts to attract 
and keep male students. For example, leaders at Malcolm X Community College saw that black men were dropping out at a higher rate than other student groups. To help more black men stay in school, leaders started a mentoring program. The program connects a teacher or other school employee with two black male students. The effort has helped. 43% of black male students dropped out between the fall of 2021 and the spring of 2022. But 93% of the men in the mentoring program stayed in school, said the school's president, David Sanders. However, Sanders said some men do not want to admit they need academic help. There's an expectation for a male, he said. He's supposed to be strong and not show weakness. College officials say some ideas about men and boys add to the enrollment difficulties. Berea College is a small private school in the southern U.S. state of Kentucky. It has 18% fewer male students now than in 2019. The college is trying to attract more men from nearby areas in the Appalachian Mountains. Rick Childers is a former student at Berea. He now works for the college and leads the school's Appalachian project. He said many of the male students he meets face the same outdated ideas about masculinity that he did. In that old way of thinking, going to college was not something a strong man would do. Childer said his father would call him college boy in a negative way. Educators say it is difficult to make college appealing to men who have been told that college is not for them. Educators say another problem is that some officials at colleges and universities do not believe male students need any special help. Joachim Budakidis is a professor of child and adolescent studies at California State University, Fullerton. He noted that some officials think men already have more advantages than women. As a result, those schools may be less likely to offer special support for male students. Budokitas said he has tried to get his university to pay attention to male enrollment and academics. But his co-workers, he said, have expressed doubt about the need for more focus on male students. Overall, men of color are less likely to attend college than white men. Because of this, Budokitas said he thinks schools should focus on men of color first. Some colleges across the country have started to do that. California's large community college system has increased support of its African-American Male Education Network and Development Program, or A2MEND. The program aims to attract and keep black men. One way it does this is by giving one-on-one -on -one mentoring and providing places for the students to meet. The program hopes this will make black students feel welcome and build a sense of community. Emmanuel Gabru is vice president of student support at Moore Park, a California community college. He is also president of the A2MEND board.
He said he thinks colleges should hire more black professors. Just 7% of faculty members at American colleges are black, according to the National Center for Education Statistics. Moore Park College said just 2% of its faculty members are black. The U.S. population is 13.6% black. In New Jersey, Montclair State University has tried several ways to attract male students from communities in that state. This includes providing tutoring, counseling, food, and other things students need. But many communities still believe men do not belong in college, said Assistant Provost Daniel Jean. There's an anti-intellectual environment that's gotten worse, he said. The definition of manhood is often flawed. Vaughn Smith, Jr. is a 23-year-old Montclair State student from Newark, New Jersey. Smith, who is black, said boys and men in poorer neighborhoods may be focused on things other than making college plans. He said most of his male high school classmates did go to college. But many of them, he added, have since dropped out. I'm Andrew Smith. And I'm Faith Perlow. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. Language is not only made up of words. Numbers are also important to communicating our thoughts. So today, we talk about some common English expressions that use numbers. Let's start with zero and the expression to zero in. Zeroing in means directing all of your attention on something or someone. We often say what that something is. For example, the defense lawyers were able to zero in on the testimony of an important witness and find problems with it. Here is another example. I know a woman who can zero in on any relationship problem and find a solution. This expression can also mean to take aim directly at something. For example, when taking a picture, a photographer might zero in on a subject. And it is the job of a quarterback in an American football game to zero in on a receiver, the player catching the ball. Other words that help to explain the expression to zero in are to focus and concentrate on. As verbs, these words both mean to direct your attention on something or someone. Now let's move to the numbers 6 and 7. If something is at sixes and sevens, it is in a state of confusion or disorder. In other words, it is all messed up. At sixes and sevens may also mean a state of disagreement between two or more people. For example, when the manager left without a word, the workplace was at sixes and sevens. Nobody knew which way was up. If you don't know which way is up, you are very confused. Word experts say this expression may have started in the 1300s. At that time, it meant taking a careless risk. Around the middle of the 1600s, 
the meaning changed to mean a state of confusion. Being at sixes and sevens is the opposite of being a ten. If something is a ten, it is really great. It is perfect or nearly perfect. This usage comes from the highest rank on a scale of 1 to 10. For example, on a scale of 1 to 10, my recent trip to Bangladesh was a 10. I loved every minute. Now let's talk about our last expression, to 86 something. If you 86 something, you get rid of it. You throw it out or you don't use it. If I pitch an idea to a group and they 86 it, they do not want it and do not plan to use it. Experts at Merriam-Webster's Online Dictionary explain that this expression may have come from 1930s business slang, meaning that an item was sold out. Maybe. Other experts think the only reason to 86 something means to get rid of it is because 86 rhymes with nix. Nix means to cancel or get rid of something. And that's the end of this Words and Their Stories. Have fun using these number expressions in your next English conversation. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. Thank you, Anna. I'm Dan Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English Broadcast. We are joined now by Anna Mateo. Welcome to the show. Can you remind our listeners about this week's topic? Thanks, Dan. Glad to be here. For my latest words in their stories, I zeroed in on some number expressions. When we zero in on something, we focus our attention on it. We have many number expressions in English, and this is a very common one. That's right. Sometimes when I have a goal and I'm getting close to reaching it, I say... I'm zeroing in on it. This is a fun one. Numbers are everywhere in language. You're right, Dan. They are. Anna, do you have a favorite number expression? Of all the number expressions, to 86 something is most interesting to me. I say it a lot, but I never knew the origin. And as it turns out, no one really knows for sure. What about you, Dan? Do you have a favorite number expression? I'll go with six of one, half dozen of the other. You have to know that a half dozen is also six. So this phrase comes up when people are discussing two ways to get something done that will work out the same in the end. Anna, this was a fun one. I hate to 86 this conversation, but... That's all the time we have. Thanks for joining me. Good one, Dan. Talk to you next time. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Abraham Lincoln. He was the 16th President of the United States. Many Americans consider him one of the country's greatest leaders. Yet people alive when Lincoln was elected in 1860 would probably be surprised by modern-day opinions about him. He had little formal education or government experience. During the presidential campaign, critics made fun of his appearance and his simple way of talking. They warned that he was not very intelligent and would harm the nation's image. Some of his opponents, especially in southern states, 
had even bigger concerns. They were afraid Lincoln would use the power of the federal government to end slavery in their states. They were right. Abraham Lincoln was born in the frontier state of Kentucky. His family was very poor and had a simple home, a log cabin. Lincoln had to support his parents and his sister by working, so he rarely went to school. Instead, he taught himself by reading books. Eventually, he became a lawyer in the state of Illinois. As a young man, Lincoln was known for several qualities. He was tall and thin. He was very strong. His neighbors remembered him cutting down trees. And he was honest. The people he defended in court called him Honest Abe. In time, Lincoln was elected to the Illinois General Assembly, the state's legislature. He also served one term as a congressman in the U.S. House of Representatives. But he was not popular there. Voters did not like his opposition to the country's war with Mexico. So Lincoln withdrew from politics and turned his attention to his family. He had married a Southern belle named Mary Todd in 1842. They had four sons, but two died when they were very young. Lincoln also developed his legal career representing railroad companies. Some people thought he might become the best railroad lawyer in the country. But that is not what happened. In the 1850s, Lincoln returned to national politics. The division over the issue of slavery was deepening. Lincoln was not an anti-slavery activist, an abolitionist. But he did not support the country's policies on slavery. Lincoln believed slavery violated the American Declaration of Independence, which said all men had the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To be clear, Lincoln did not believe that black people should have the same rights as white U.S. citizens but he did not agree that one person should own other people or profit from their work while they earned nothing and were held captive. Lincoln decided to compete in elections for a seat in the U.S. Senate. He was chosen as the candidate of a new anti-slavery party. Members called themselves Republicans. During the election campaign, Lincoln famously discussed the issue of slavery in a series of debates with Stephen Douglas, the Democratic Party's candidate. Lincoln's words moved some voters, but they did not earn him enough votes to get elected. So, while Douglas took the seat in the Senate, Lincoln prepared to run for president. Lincoln said that, if he were elected, he would not expand slavery to new territories in the country's west. But he promised not to interfere with slavery in the southern states, where it already existed. Voters in southern slaveholding states did not trust Lincoln. Not a single southern state supported him in the election of 1860. But he won anyway. The support of anti-slavery Northerners gave him the presidency. In answer, seven Southern states withdrew from the Union. Four more later joined them. These states formed a new government called the Confederate States of America, or the Confederacy. Confederate officials chose their own president and wrote their own constitution, 
which permitted each state control over its own laws, especially laws that protected slavery. Confederate officials said they no longer recognized the power of the U.S. federal government or its chief executive. As that chief executive, Lincoln would have to decide what to do. President Lincoln's first test came a little more than a month after he was sworn in. The event involved Fort Sumter, a federal military base on an island off the coast of South Carolina. Soldiers on the base needed food. Lincoln said he would send some by ship. But Confederate officials considered the port part of South Carolina, which belonged to the Confederacy. They demanded that the Union soldiers leave the fort. But Union forces and the U.S. president ignored the Confederates' demands. As promised, Lincoln sent the supply ships. As expected, Confederate soldiers attacked. A day and a half later, the fort's Union soldiers surrendered. The clash did not last long, and no one was killed in the fighting. But the battle at Fort Sumter marked the official beginning of hostilities between the Union and the Confederacy. Lincoln immediately took action to answer the loss at Fort Sumter. He called on state militias for troops and asked for a special meeting of Congress. The president was careful not to ask Congress to make an official declaration of war, in part because he did not want to recognize the Confederacy as a separate nation. Instead, he called the southern states' opposition a rebellion. However, the conflict between the southern Confederacy and the northern Union was a civil war. Neither side expected the fighting to last very long, a few weeks or maybe months. Instead, the Civil War lasted four and a half years. Most of the major battles took place near Washington, D.C., in the states of Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. Soldiers and civilians also clashed in the West, in Tennessee, as well as in the southern states of Mississippi, South Carolina, and Georgia. But the war involved the entire country. At least four million men fought in it. Among the soldiers were African American and Native American men. The conflict divided families. Brothers, fathers, and sons fought against each other. Women in both the North and South also supported the war effort. They cooked meals, made and repaired clothing for the troops, served as nurses, and cared for the soldiers. Both white and African-American women also took over the work of men who had left to fight. And more than 620,000 men died. Recent scholarship says as many as 750,000. The Civil War remains the bloodiest war in American history. And it changed the country. The war radically affected American politics, economics, and society. Abraham Lincoln was the U.S. president through all of it. Next week... We will talk more about Lincoln's presidency and his legacy. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's the Learning English broadcast for today. Thank you, Kelly, for that report. And thanks to our VOA colleagues for their work on today's program. Most importantly, thank you for listening. For more, visit our website at learningenglish.voanews.com. 
I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedel. 